Welcome, megalomaniacal marshals, ethically bereft scientists, and mutating natives to episode 368 of an unearthly podcast, streaming live on the 26th of August, 2020, and featuring The Mutants, written by Bob Baker and Dave Martin, and starring John Pertwee as the Doctor and Katie Manning as Joe Grant. I am Bill Sylvia, the Man in Black, now from a new location. With me are Randy Ronson McCulloch. Good evening. Mad Matt Winchell. Nothing flashy, just got water. And Thomas Fireheart. Can't talk, eating. <laughs> so, speaking of new location, Bill, how's Ohio? Pretty good. I'm still kind of getting used to things around. Uh, I'm not used to being in a relatively small town. Um, but in many cases, especially being a college town, a lot of what I'm finding is that, um, as we, I think as we discussed last time I was on here, uh, a lot of things are available, but require a little bit more, uh, digging than I'm used to. Um, such as I think there's a lot of places that would be on Instacart in a larger city that are not on Instacart kind of things of that nature. Um, what town are you in again? Athens. Athens, Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Elsa, yeah, I believe, as we mentioned last time, you need to stop being lazy and go call them. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I had to look up again and figure out what the, the total estimated, or the estimated population mm -hmm. of Athens is, and it's about... The, the population is pretty much the university, plus in about another 10 to 20 percent. It's about 24,000. Yeah, and the un the university itself is twenty thousand. So it's about a quarter of the size of Madison proper. Tiny, and still <laughs> about fifteen times the size of my mother's college town. <laughs> that. How do you fit a college in a town that's one fifty? <laughs> It was that, it, that's it, a middle school. It's a it's it was a it's a tech college, and a lot of people migrated from mm -hmm. out of town. Mm -hmm. I I say a middle school. I have heard of high schools with less than a thousand people in them. I I don't know how I would react to actually seeing one. It does not compute with my experience of high school. Hmm. <laughs> Um, yeah, I can't remember how many people were in my high school, but how was the trip? Mm. Um, so it was fairly good. So, uh, the way that, um, the way Google maps took me as being the shortest and avoiding traffic the most was I basically went not quite straight South. Like I didn't go through New York city, but I went almost, almost straight South to the point of dipping through Jersey and then going almost straight west from Jersey. So I went through pretty much as many states as I could possibly go through on that route, which I <laughs> believe was seven, including the starting and ending states. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, once I got to the long, once I got, once I started going east, it was pretty smooth. Because at that point, there was uh, usually a rest area every state. Every time I thought that I wouldn't find a rest area and I pulled over to like look for a gas station, I got back on and immediately found a rest area. Um, um, every time you went, that's when you start going east? Oh, sorry, west. <laughs> I was going to say, there's not much left to east. <laughs> that would have been yeah. a lot of swimming. <laughs> you riding yep. a duck these days, Bill? Hmm. <laughs> uh, but my biggest uh, obstacle in terms of that was so I don't know if it's me or if it's the late, the newer model of Samsung phones with the uh, USB-C charging ports uh, but for some reason every time I have one of these phones for six months or so the charging port no longer works so I charge mine wirelessly and the wireless just needs a stronger power source or it, it charges very quickly on a regular home outlet but if you have a weaker outlet, it either doesn't charge at all or it's very slowly. 
If you're talking so, about charging in a car, it's usually very slowly. So either charging, way. charging <laughs> the car did not have enough power to activate the wireless charging port. Um, so I Oof. could not charge my phone at all while driving. Um, so I would often pull over for 45 minutes, get another 10% charge, drive for two hours, and then repeat the process. Um, so that was the longest part of uh, the longest part of that. And of course, there were times, especially uh, once I got to Ohio, a lot of the exits are not very helpfully named. They're named things like County Road 50 or Township Road 100. Uh, so that doesn't really tell you what town you're in or if you're at the right exit. So I needed to make sure Google Maps was working. But I got, I did what I needed to do and got there, got here on time to get my keys. <laughs> Just about ready to pass out after that? Yeah, pretty much. I got here. Um, I unloaded maybe a third of the, no, actually, I think I came in. Um, I was supposed to inspect the apartment. So I walked around, took a few pictures, uh, ordered like the first delivery I could find on DoorDash, um, had some unloaded, maybe a third of the, the vehicle, um, crashed for a bit, got up, unloaded a little bit more, went to Walmart for some of the biggest essentials that I needed in the apartment, like shower shower curtains and things that you can't really do everything you need to in the morning without. And then I finished unpacking. I finished unloading the next morning. Mm. Yeah, that's about a nine and a half hour drive. And nine and a half hour with no stops. Yeah. I spent so. about 15 hours total from start to finish. Oh, yeah, I, I would have basically just gotten there and passed out. <laughs> it also doesn't help that, like, I was so anxious about the whole thing. I had planned to take, like, a three- or four-hour nap before leaving, and then maybe, like, if needed, pull over for, like, a two-hour nap or whatever. But I could not fall asleep for more than 30 minutes at a time, uh, either, either before I left or when I stopped uh, at rest areas. So I never did sleep more than 30, you know, so I basically went from 11 a.m. Wednesday morning until dinner time Thursday without sleeping more than 30 minutes at a, at a, at a time. Ooh. And while doing a lot of physical labor in the process in terms, at least in the beginning and end of that, not in the middle, obviously. So, yeah, I was very much crashed when it was time to. <laughs> uh, and then I was sore the next day and a half. Uh, I well, bet. That, just the like the funny thing about you say that was like a nine hour drive if you hadn't stopped. It's like, oh, that's making. Yeah, me I know that hard. that that's that's like to the that's to the grocery store in Australia. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> well, at least it's like from where I live in North Queensland to my state capital is like a 10 hour drive. <laughs> And that's on the highway. So, um, well, yeah. a good chunk of this is that you have to go over um, what the Blue Ridge Mountains, I think. I went past some mountains, and I was sitting there. I was like, I thought the Appalachians were farther east. So either there's another mountain range I don't know about, or they're farther west than I thought they were. But I definitely went over some area of mountains. Well, yeah, I mean, you were you were in West Virginia, so right, that would have been the Blue Ridge. Okay, Giant Devon doesn't lie. Yeah, the, the weird <laughs> the, the, the weird thing is there was an there was um, I was looking like I you know see the exit signs as I drive by, and like there's a gap between some mountains. And it was called Rocky Gap. And I'm like, I know I'm nowhere near the Rockies. If I'm near the Rockies, I'm in the wrong place. And I teleported. There's no way I've been driving long enough to get to the Rockies. Yeah, you're not in Colorado. <laughs> Space is warped and time is bendable. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's always funny to me how, like, in the U.S., you can drive for that long and go through several states. Whereas here, you would have to be in a very specific... Whereas in Europe, if you drive that long, you're like 
in a, you're considered in a different part of the world. <laughs> Well, to be I, fair, to run like, through oh, that now, maze, now, now, now you're in Eastern Europe. To be fair, <laughs> in to run through that maze states, uh, in that short of a period of a time, you really can only do that on the east. Uh, That's yeah, pretty much the, the east coast. On there, the east coast, there, a lot smaller than anywhere else, and than anywhere else in the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, the Mississippi River seems to be the divider. I mean. Iowa, Missouri aren't that mm -hmm. big, but yeah, traveling through Nebraska, Colorado, Utah, those take a lot longer. And right. Te Texas and Alaska are, are, are mm -hmm. big. But you yeah, never, I mean, you, I'm, I'm pretty Thomas, sure from east to west, Texas is at least a 10 hour drive. You've got to remember something, Thomas. Your country is its own damn continent. Oh, yeah. Oh, like Texas fits in my home state several times, I think, or at least twice. <laughs> yeah, and you only live along the shoreline for the most part. You are mm. unique in that aspect, unless there are people <laughs> that are that are living down in uh, Antarctica. But yeah, <laughs> normally a continent consists of several countries, mm. which then consists of several provinces and states. No, no. Australia is just one big freaking country. So, <laughs> I mean, I always so joke I, that like, and and Europe um, probably would not be considered its own continent if not for just the amount of people and amount of power accumulated there. Because I I always look at it and wonder why it's considered a separate landmass from Asia. Technically, it has its own mm. continental shelf separate from Asia. But so does India. I believe. I, I'm fairly certain. Um, not 100% certain of that. I, I mean, it could be. Um, in which case, arguments could be made that India would be its own continent. but mm -hmm. Like, it's usually referred to as the subcontinent. A subcontinent just means that that's a section. I mean, technically, um, the uh, Iberian Peninsula would be considered a subcontinent, too. Hmm. Oh, or Florida then. Yeah. <laughs> or the, the Balkans or, uh, you know. Mm. You know, each one of those could be considered a subcontinent. But, um, yeah, the United States took Europe as its template when they made themselves, you know, one um, big country, smaller provinces and territories. Australia's just like, nope. <laughs> to be fair, there's a whole lot of nothing in the middle, so <laughs> that's one of the reasons Texas is so large mm -hmm. too, is because there's a whole lot of nothing. Well, in to the be middle. fair, <laughs> I mean, I imagine if the um, if the uh, uh, Aboriginal nations uh, ha had full nationhood uh, to the point oh, of yeah, appearing on <laughs> maps, then uh, <laughs> Australia would be much, much probably more akin to many mm. other places. Oh yeah, um, I mean anyway. it's always still it's always still funny to me that you can basically say that the entire western half of the continent is its own state. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, on tonight's show, he says, moving us on along. Yep, <laughs> we've got quite a few birthdays. It's the, it's the best birthday week of the year. Some news <laughs> articles. And then we've got some geek talk. Uh, Bill is going to play catch up from last week. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then we've got our summary, our episode review, our final thoughts, and our ratings. So let's move this into birthdays. The first birthday we have is on August 20th, right after we got off last week. And that's the big mega one. Because mm -hmm. we've got the birthday of Sophie Aldred, who played Ace from 87 to 89. She turned 58. James Marsters, who played Captain John Hart in Torchwood Season 2, also turned 58. Hmm. Sylvester McCoy, who played the Doctor from 87 to 89, turned 77. And a Anthony Ainley, who played the master from 1981 to 1989, would have been 88, but died in 2004 at the age of 71. One of these things is not like the other things. 
So, yeah, all those people share a birthday on the same day, and all of them were involved in Doctor Who one way or another. Most of them in the same era. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, know the day, time... we know the day in which the Doctor Who Quisette Satirac will be born. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for some reason, you put them in that order instead of putting the three 80s actors together. and then uh, I, I put them in the order that they, that they came to me, so... <laughs> so that's just how hmm. they got there all right so then we move over to the 22nd and the birthday of james corden who played craig owens in the lodger and closing time he turned 42 uh next is the birthday of mark williams who interesting enough played brian williams rory's father um a couple of times in um 2012 he turned 61 i don't know why they didn't just name the character mark yeah i'm kind of <laughs> wondering that too and then uh the 26th a uh, today is the birthday of phil collinson one of the original producers of new who from 2004 back when it was filming uh to 2008 he turned 50 so, happy birthday to Sophie, James, Sylvester, Anthony, James, Mark, and Phil. All right. All right. So, moving on to cast and crew news. A few months ago, we reported that Peter Capaldi was going to be in James Gunn's Suicide Squad sequel, but we didn't know in what role. Now we do. Released as part of DC Fandome, a streaming version of Comic-Con held last weekend, we got to see the character reveal trailer for The Suicide Squad. Peter Capaldi's role was finally revealed, The Thinker, a villain last seen in CW's The Flash Season 4. Capaldi's version seems more similar to the comic book version, with his thinking cap being grafted to his head. Also appearing is Idris Elba as Bloodsport, Nathan Fillion as TDK, uh, a recreation of Arms Fall Off Boy, and pro wrestler John Cena as Peacemaker. Returning from the first movie are Viola Davis as Amanda Walker, Joel Kinnaman as Colonel Rick Flagg, Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn, and Jai Courtney as Captain Boomerang. That's Amanda Waller, by the way. Oh, did I miss it? Did I misspeak? No, you, you, you called her Walker, but... Oh, <laughs> Yeah. Yes, Amanda Waller. Yeah. There's no um, K there. <laughs> yeah, we did, Walker we did. is a much more common name, even though I should have known better, so I'm not sure why my brain autocorrected. <laughs> Options autocorrect off, Bill. <laughs> autocorrect always off. If, autocorrect if could, always wrong. If you could turn autocorrect in your brain off, my job as a social psychologist would be much less necessary. Uh. <laughs> But no, um, we were discussing this before the stream, and the the list of people in this movie is like the B list of B list. Mm. Uh, but then again, James Gunn has great work working with the B list of B list. Mm -hmm. I mean, he took mm. Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, and, Guardians and, of the Galaxy. Yeah, had no right to be the um, blockbuster I mean, it was. <laughs> I, do, I do actually recall even like I was watching something. The other day where a youtube channel i follow was reacting to this and pointed out that james gunn seems to get the point that this is mainly like the suicide squad mainly covers b-list or lower villains anyway so it kind of makes sense to have more characters oh, every that, that every now and then it. they get an a-list villain in there but mm. well the closest to their regular a-list would be bane as far as i'm aware Bane is considered an A-list. I mean, he had his he had major arcs in Batman. Yeah, he mm -hmm. he was at least for a long while there a regular. Mm -hmm. I just remember losing my shit when I realized that Nathan Fillion is basically playing Armful Off Boy. <laughs> it was just, uh, I only know he exists because of Linkara, but that was just I laughed mm. so hard, and I was just like, "Yes, just just give me give this to me," especially I, knowing that the villain is going to be Starro. For for like, for anybody who's not aware, Arms Fall Off Boy, I believe, was a uh, a 
quote unquote super powered individual who had tried out to be a member of the Legion of Superheroes and was not accepted for membership. <laughs> I never had even heard of him before this, but yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm aware of him. <laughs> <laughs> Pop off his arm and beat beat somebody with it like a club. <laughs> that is such. Oh, I mean, what were they mm. thinking of when they decided to create this character? I mean, he, I think he it was, was the golden age, so they weren't really he, thinking that hard at all. No, um, uh, it was late. I think 80s. it was Silver Age. Oh, was it? Was it late eighties? It was eighty nine. Yeah. Okay. Oh so... wow! Actually, that would be like late bronze. I don't know what the Legion was like at that time, but either way, this like this was definitely a gag character for a relatively gaggy team um, that was not accepted to be in that team because he was too much of a gag. So I think that's all they were thinking. Yeah, that might have been that might he probably have been. he probably appeared in like two panels. I, I'm honestly not sure. <laughs> and somebody else just took him and ran with him. Seems like it. He, I think he got a cult following from people like Linkara. Like, hey, look at this wacky crap. <laughs> uh, apparently, well, that reminds eventually... that reminds me. Is Snowflame uh, Marvel or DC? DC. Yeah, DC. So Snowflame could be in Suicide Squad three, but it would Maybe. have to be R rated. <laughs> well, he he would be have to be very R rated due to his particular power <laughs> yeah. set. Yeah, honestly, it would be like it, it'd either be that, or if they did like a full blown Harley Quinn solo movie, that would be kind of hilarious. To... <laughs> what what is this character? I'm sorry, Snowflame. Uh, Snowflame, Snowflame, the cocaine powered a... supervillain. Oh Jesus! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he literally gets the powers by snow. And and that one, that. Randy, is even better because it's late '80s, early '90s. <laughs> Yeah. Oh jeez. <laughs> oh, God. And like what the like the group that he was up against was a group where it's like basically oh we we're trying to bring humanity further along by hmm. having you guys get together and fuck I, or something. I kinda <laughs> wanna go see who wrote who who created Snowflame. Like it I would not be shocked if it was like Mark Millar. Mm. I don't recall Honestly, but when I, I do when know I there's first... a fan comic now. <laughs> <laughs> When I first saw it, like the characters show up in Linkara stuff, I wasn't aware that it was a real character, so I thought he just made him up. No, I, <laughs> I, I knew he, he reviewed real, real comic like, books. Oh I'm like, oh dear lord. <laughs> <laughs> um, looks like it was done in a series created by Steve Englehart. New Guardians. That's it. That's the series yeah. he was in. Yep. Um. Anyway, we are so off topic here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess we move on to Big Finish. Yes, and we've got a couple of new releases from Big Finish. Uh, the first one is Torchwood Soho Parasite. This is a, another uh, Torchwood re in time release involving um, Gwen's partner from the police force having somehow gone back in time through the rift. And this time they seem to be in World War II fighting off Nazi parasites. Hmm. Uh, the other new release is Out of Time, which is a fourth Doctor, tenth Doctor crossover. And yes, they do meet in the course of the audio. Yay. So that's currently what's out now from Big Finish. The uh, free uh, audio this week was not a Doctor Who, so I did not include it. Uh, uh -huh. so those, are, those are arguably still the two most popular Doctors. Oh, yeah, mm. that's probably why so, they did ar it. Arguably. Right. They're, they're guaranteed to be at least in everybody's top five somewhere, most likely. Mm. So yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much all the news we have. So moving on to Geek Talk. Mm -hmm. So starting off with movies, Wayne's World. Yep. In hindsight, it was weird knowing, realizing that I had never actually seen this before. Because um, <clears throat> even bits that I thought were going to happen never did. And then I realized, oh, I must have seen Wayne's World 2. And like maybe like the very end of this movie, 
Um, I've seen clips from this movie, like the the no stairway denied bit, an extreme close up and stuff like that. But yeah, never seen the whole movie until now. Um, I meant to talk about it last week, but like to totally forgot. <laughs> um, uh, because I'd watched it as part of like a watch party thing. Um, so it just, I don't know why, but it can completely slipped my mind that I had. I honestly think this movie's aged fairly well. Um, at least for me anyway, for others, it might have aged horribly. Um, really just the kind of juvenile humor they're going for, I thought it would have aged a bit poorly, at least for me, but nope. <laughs> um, a lot of the jokes still stand up. Um, of course, it's funny because I feel like the bit, one of my favorite bits was even just like, there's a bit where he's hitting on uh, that woman, Cassandra, who was supposed to be Chinese, and he's like, wow, it was, oh, it was wild out there. Everybody was kung fu fighting, and immediately he's just like, oh, that was the wrong thing to say. And she just immediately is like, yep, bye. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, you know, for the time, that's kind of amazing that the character would be self-aware enough to be like, oh, I fucked up. <laughs> was, um, that, was that the one where they met Alice Cooper? Second one yes. was. Oh, I the thought. second one. No, he's, I, well, he must be in both then, because he was definitely in the first one where they go to. I'm pretty sure he shows up for the concert that... and that they have in the second one, right? Or was it? Yeah, we we might be in both. We're, we're talking about where where they get the backstage pass to go see him. Yeah, the backstage pass one is in the first movie. Okay. Yeah. And the the talking about like him just going into a <laughs> going the into the, the history of the state that they're in. Yeah, the one where they ba- they fall to their knees and do the we're not worthy to him. And yeah. He holds out his hand <laughs> like he's freaking royalty. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Uh. Um. Yeah, like, I, I, though, and, you know, as much as I love that early bit, I feel like the biggest laugh was probably the Terminator 2 joke. Have you seen this boy? Ah! And <laughs> just drives off. <laughs> uh, and that was topical at the time, because that was, what, about 93 that that movie was made? Uh, I think they either well they kind of came out the same year, but I think Wayne's World was maybe ninety two and the sequel was ninety three. Um, so yeah, still fairly close to when Terminator Two came out. So yeah, relatively fresh gag. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, you like that would have, yeah, that that would have gone over the heads of like some of the people I was watching the movie with because they were like of a generation that probably hasn't seen um terminator 2 necessarily it's like the only um, that and the original the only two terminator movies worth seeing <laughs> yeah sadly i still need to um, see the other ones to make an official opinion but yeah as far as i've been made aware yeah <laughs> uh, um but yeah it's it was interesting. Of course, it was funny realizing that I do did realize. Um, oh my god, what's his name? The guy playing Goth, Dana Carvey. That's it. Yeah, I, I reckon. I suddenly it like occurred to me. Oh yeah, I do know who that actor is. This is probably the most successful movie he's ever been in. Yeah, that's <laughs> because yeah. pretty much everything else he was well, in. Yeah, bombed. that's because he basically did this, or he did SNL, where he you know basically was sidekicked with mike myers he yeah. did this he went on to do one other movie which was man of man of disguise or something like that masters of disguise Master yeah. of disguise, Master of disguise, yeah. disguise and then he basically dropped out of acting for over a decade yeah um because he, he, he wound up having to race his kid solo or something like that yeah, as, as, like from what I can tell, he's done he'd done movies before and had done a couple since. 
but they were all uh, opportunity knocks is the one i was thinking of that he'd definitely done before that came out the year i was born um so he'd done like a couple of movies since and as far as i'm aware they were all with him as probably the lead and they all bombed or at least didn't perform well so this is like the one thing he has <laughs> Which has got to kind of suck when you consider that Mike Myers, like when you're having that career and Mike Myers went on to just kind of do Austin Powers. The hype. Yeah. Austin <laughs> Powers, Shrek. Um. Yeah, but you see, the thing is, Mike Myers took Wayne's World, sprung board into Austin Powers, and hmm. from there got to punch his own ticket. Yeah. At In least a way, for I'm kind about of... a, at least for about a decade, his star has kind of fallen a bit. Yeah, uh, other, mostly other due than, to lack of activity, as far as I'm aware. No, it was mostly due to those horrid Dr. Seuss movies he made. Oh, I forgot well, about those. It, That's it was right. more so, as far as I recall, it was more so that like Love Guru movie or whatever that like absolutely tanked, and that was like the last movie he ever really did. Is he still making Shrek movies? Yeah, uh, I think, technically, I think that they, they, I think they're working on a Shrek five, but there's there's still like that hasn't come out yet. Oh, I really thought they I really thought they had a five out already. Okay. No, they they've done no, not four and even those are the, kind they, of they, they did out. four and I think there's been a few side characters that got their own movies. Yeah, there's been right. like two Puss in Boots Puss in Boots movies, I mm -hmm. think. Um uh, and they've probably done like little skits here and there. A Shrek, maybe like animated. Oh, I see. There was a musical that had a TV adaptation that did not involve the original cast. Mm. Um, yeah, I would definitely say, as far as Wayne's World goes, to check it out. Like, if you hate fourth wall breaking humor or just general meta humor, like really cranked up, avoid it. But if you like that kind of stuff, go for it. And I guess the one other interesting factoid that I remembered about this movie was the woman who plays Cassandra in this is the voice of Nani from Lilo and Stitch. So that was interesting <laughs> to actually see her acting as a person in something because I was like, she looks familiar. It was weird that Nani was the role that I ended up re remembering her from, but yeah. <laughs> hmm. All right, you good? Yep. All right. So from there, we're moving on to the next one, which is me for System Shock Enhanced Edition. Uh, so basic setup of this one is that a hacker is caught by world big, uh, big worldwide uh, corporation trying to hack into their systems. But instead of just turning it over to the police and being put away for the rest of his life, uh, the second in command of the company uh, actually uh, talks to him, uh, shoots him up to the satellite and offers him uh, essentially a free um, ha um, uh, what do you want to call it? jack upgrade for his head, so he can literally plug himself into a computer. Uh, and he will give them this military-level upgrade if he would hack into the uh, satellite's AI and do some uh, extra programming for it. Um, he manages to do so, goes into a hibernation after he gets the... Uh, the um, um, Jack put into his skull and has to go under for six months. When he wakes up, everyone is gone and the place is crawling with a combination of both mutants and uh, various kinds of cyborgs and he has to try to figure out what's going on and why everything suddenly shut down. Um, long story short, it's the AI he messed with. She went psychotic. The guy who is second uh, CEO in command of the company uh, willingly became a cyborg himself, and uh, you actually have to fight him three times in the game. Um, I mean, uh, the, the game is mostly a first-person uh, simulator, I guess they call these, uh, where you're supposed to be essentially... The entire game is a first-person like dungeon dive, and you're trying to work from uh, the bottom floor where you're able to access of the satellite all the way up to the bridge where the AI's main computer is stored. Um, along the way, you have to deal with several, several different kinds of mutants and cyborgs. Um, 
You have to deal with taking out uh, different uh, computer nodes and cameras in order to reduce the security that the AI has over certain floors. So you can unlock rooms and uh, uh, more easily reach other obstacles and pick up more gear. Um, and this game is completely bonkers, Betty, when it comes to weapons. I had the Robocop gun. I had Han Solo's blaster. I had a Stormtrooper rifle. I had a lightsaber in this game. They called it a knockoff name, but it's a lightsaber. Um, uh, I'm trying to think what else did I have. I basically had a, a super futuristic minigun. As one of my alternate weapons, that one almost ran out of ammo by the end. Um, and actually, the lightsaber was probably the best go-to weapon. If it wasn't for the fact that it's a melee weapon, it would be better. <laughs> um, uh, I will say that the majority of the game is works really well, at least in the enhanced edition. I will say, however, there are still some minor issues. In particular... Um, about midway through the game, I didn't realize I had missed something that I was supposed to do in a certain kind of order, and the game, uh, for a reason, its logic didn't quite work. Like, you're supposed to raise the shields on the satellite, then set off a laser so it hits the shields and blows off half of the uh, bottom half of the satellite. And for a reason, it's like, wait, I have the shields on. Why do I also need to turn? on the laser security, and then turn it back off again. That makes literally no sense, but apparently you have to in order to aim the lasers or something. I don't know. It's really weird. Um, but also, very close to the end of the game, there's a sequence of like maze tunnels that you have to quickly run through and get to this one panel. Uh, the easiest way to deal with this is to run through it, drop a logic device into the panel, and it'll automatically... Uh, fix the puzzle for you, which will unlock the one of the last doors you need in the end of the game. But the problem is the entirety of the maze is filled with these little uh, little robots that scoot around and will go super fast when they spot you. And when they get within reach of you, they literally explode in your face and can kill you with only two hits. And the entirety of the maze is not only crawling with them, but crawling with them as they continue to respawn the entire time you're there. And that, and having to deal with the really clunky, like, early 80, early 90s uh, menu, where you have to, like, cycle through, like, five pages of menus to try and find the stuff you're looking for and drop it in very clunkily with the mouse and then go back to first-person view and then run is really, really horrendous. It's... Uh, I it took, I think, almost 10 tries to find get that and not die to it. It was pretty harsh, and that was worse than the end boss battle. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> um, I will say a majority of the game is really fun, though, despite any of these little issues. Um, I'm trying to think. I, I cleared it in, like, 16 hours? Something like that? Uh, I could have taken more time. I could have probably... Uh, gun diving for more secret doors and stuff if I really want to, but I felt like I really didn't miss anything. The majority of the stuff I really needed, I already found and got to the end of the game with it. Uh, I guess that's about it. All right, that's what I was about to ask. All right, well, that will do it for our Geek Talk. Um, from there, we're going to go to the review of Shame, and Bill will uh, talk about last week's episode, which he missed because he was in transit. So not as shamey as other stuff, but still. <laughs> You're late. <laughs> so before I really get into it, I want to ask if, um, because I didn't get a chance to listen to last week's podcast yet, but have uh, is there a consensus as to whether the alien in orbit being able to speak um, is a plot hole or is due to the TARDIS translating their voice? Oh, we didn't really think about that. It would probably do the TARDIS. 
I just figured they had already heard English and it and was translating <laughs> for them. I actually, yeah, actually, I would have thought that maybe and, since they were already communicating with the humans, they and, probably just had a translator up there for themselves. Considering considering what a major plot thread it was that they could not communicate with the ambassadors, and yet the people who were not ambassadors were able to communicate perfectly in English. I figured that was because they had they had a translation device up there, some kind yeah. of big funky thing that wouldn't fit on a person. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that that makes the most sense now that I think of it. Of course, afterwards. they never bother to explain it. Of course, they don't. Right. But they don't need to. They're in a giant spaceship. They can do whatever they <laughs> want. <laughs> um. So, in other things on this episode, I think this was a very successful episode in terms of leaning into the whole. Uh, spy thriller theme of uh this part of this era of the show they really kind of showed what everything that that would be about they had um i like the uh the changing van uh which i think is a spy movie trope with it changing the sides and changing the license plates inspector gadget hit that on the head yeah <laughs> right um so yeah i thought it was pretty successful at leaning into that theme um, what I did think was a weakness was I felt like this had that one more thing syndrome where like they just seemed like um, like oh we need to fit one more episode in here so um, that's not the real big bad this is the real big bad and it's it seemed like uh, it was getting contrived at a certain point where they were just throwing more and more things that uh, weren't really making the story any better. Uh, my favorite scene is when you're sitting waiting, okay, the doctor is working on this communication device. What's he going to say? How is he going to get out of here? And instead you find out he's been spending his time making an SOS, making a broadcaster that will pretty much interfere with every device for miles around to send out an SOS. Um, so I just thought that was a funny subversion and, a, uh, enjoy and an enjoyable scene. And... Yeah, so I uh, least favorite scene kind of along the line of uh, what I mentioned in that um, when there was, yeah, yet another evil faction um, just to kind of add in an extra episode into the into the mix. So and I I don't want to particularly harp on this because I do feel that even though the episode did have spots where it could have been shorter and um, it might have been better as a six-parter than a seven-parter. I did get the feeling between watching this and watching the episodes prior to this, it kind of feels like this was a like a golden age for Doctor Who in terms of long stories. It is, um, it's much more successful than a seven or an eight-parter in the black and white era and does not drag nearly as much, even when it does have issues as the ones that I've mentioned. And I'd have to look back at our ratings for six parters in the seven for in the Tom Baker era and see if uh, if they're as successful as the ones in the third Doctor era. But it just seems like the the long stories are pulled off much better and much more intricately in the third Doctor era than they are in the time uh, period before it and sometimes the time periods after it. Um, let's see. Genesis of the Daleks was a six-parter, got a 4.8. Right, that's a, that's a beloved episode. Um, Armageddon Factor was a six-parter, got a 4.8. Hmm. Um, trying to figure out if we've done any other six-parters in the Tom Baker era. Ah, and I'm hmm. thinking we haven't. Okay. We have to go through the long ones yet. Right, right. If nothing else, it probably helps that starting with the Pertwee era, the seasons basically got chopped in half from what they were yeah. doing previously. Yeah, that's definitely part of it. Mm -hmm. They went from a fifty-two week, uh, a fifty-two week, or fifty-two week filming year to a twenty-six. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it especially helps that, uh, you, uh, particularly for uh, season seven they could pretty much make four sets and use them for 90% of the scenes in the season. <laughs> Thereabouts. So I struggled a little bit with rating this because it's definitely, I feel better than a 3.5, mm -hmm. 
I wasn't quite sure if it was good enough for a four, but definitely I would say not quite to the level of a 4.5. Um, so ultimately I'm going with a 4.0. You negative Nancy. Really? I'm pretty yeah. sure with the lowest we gave it was a 4.5. Yep. The oh, lowest, wow. The lowest gotten was a 4.5. That 4.0 will drop it from its 4.8 that it was at to a 4.6. Uh, Shake my fist. Which, if, will, which will drop it from its former location at number 24 to number 41. If it was a six-parter, I think I would have given it a 4.5. Well, you're going to have the chance today because we're reviewing a six-parter next. Shake my fist. And that is a segue, as we are going to go from this one to our summary for tonight's episode, The Mutants. And that's Thomas. All right, stopwatch is Thomas up. is a mutant? <laughs> oh, he's doing a summary. Uh, Thomas? He's oh, muted. Thomas, you're muted. And not in the mutant way. Thomas? Uh, I'm Sorry. back. I was like, he's no longer muted, but he's still silent. <laughs> um, it occurred to me that I, since I was finished eating, I should probably check my stuff in the bin and then realized uh, I'm probably not going to be back by the, t- by the time they're done. Oh, well. Yeah, well, uh, the episode summary's up, and that's you. Yeah. All right, you ready? Okay. Uh, uh, yep. All right, starting in three, two, one, go. Okay, we begin on the planet Solos as a mutt is being chased by chased down by some humans and is killed, with the leader telling him to rule it as having found it dead. Uh, we then cut to the doctor working on something for Bessie, only to be sent something by the Time Lord, some sort of weird box um, that he has to deliver and that he can't open it and it can only be opened for whoever it's meant for. Um, with the Time Lord sending them and the TARDIS up to a sky base in what appear- what ends up turning out to be the 30th century over a planet called Solos. Uh, the Doctor and Joe force their way out of the storage room that they arrived in, only to be found by some guards. In the meantime, we find out the Earth Empire has decided to give the people of Solos, Solos their independence, as they can't afford to continue the Empire anymore and are returning to Earth. Uh, after the Doctor bluffs his way around explaining anything, and the Marshal's failed attempt at forcing the box open, the administrator goes into a meeting with some Salonians to announce their independence, but being a windbag, he goes on a long-winded speech, only to be killed with a dart during an inadvertent distraction. Uh, the Salonian named Kai runs off, despite being innocent, and the Doctor realizes the box is for him when it starts to open up upon Kai, touching it when he tries to get past. Uh, Joe's, Joe goes after Kai, only end up only to end up with him on Solos. Uh almost dying as they escape onto the planet's surface until Kai is able to steal an oxygen mask from a guard that he guard that he's able to knock out. Uh, meanwhile, the Doctor is forced to try and get the box open forcibly, uh, with the Marshal using Finding Joe as leverage. Uh, the Marshal then deals with the Salonian who got to kill the administ- who he got to kill the administrator, ending his alliance with the man's father, a Salonian named Va- Varan, who escapes before the Marshal can kill him as well. Uh, after a test of a particle reverser, the Doctor decides to help find to help find Varan, stopping Stubbs, one of the guards, from killing him and Varan explaining what happened, with them deciding to help him. After having to lie to him about having found Joe, Stubbs' friend Cotton tells the Doctor the truth, and they plan to make a plan for him to escape, with the Doctor and Varan ending up on Solos. Uh, a full-fledged mutt seems to come after Joe and Kai, uh, but Kai manages to ward it off with fire before taking Joe deeper into the caves. 
only to run into more mutts and Joe to run off and get lost in the tunnels. Passing out in one particular spot, she ends up in with a person in a hazmat looking suit approaching her. The doctor finds Kai and helps scares off the mutts, giving the box to Kai which opens and is found to contain some stone tablets with writing that none of the current day Salonians can read. After Varen leaves, they manage to find Joe in one of the tunnels, apparently having been rescued by the mysterious figure. As the marshal traps him in the caves and tries to kill them with gas, the group, now joined by Stubbs and Cotton, are saved by the figure who saved Joe, who turns out to be Professor Sondergaard, a man previously mentioned by Kai as being a human that was doing experiments on the planet. Um, realizing the entire mountain is now starting to crumble, the doctor gets the others to leave, staying behind with Sondergaard, and together they determine the tablets to pick the seasonal calendars and that they that the mutation the Salonians have been going through is a natural state they take on as the planet goes through its cycles, uh, only that it's been accelerated by the Marshall and Jaeger's experiments. Uh, Joe Stubbs, Kai, and Cotton are captured by Varen and his people, who are now further along in their mutation, and forced to go with them in an attack on the sky base as the Marshall is forcing Jaeger to launch rockets to try and make the atmosphere breathable for humans. Uh, during Varen's attack, all his men are killed, and the Marshal blasts a hole in the sky base, with Varen being sucked out while the others manage to escape the room, only to be taken prisoner. The Doctor makes it back to sky base, only to be forced to help fix what Jaeger did, to using Joe and the others as leverage over him, who have convinced the Marshal that the Doctor and Joe were sent by Earth Control to evaluate things. Joe manages to free herself and then the others, managing to get a message through to the inspector's ship only for Stubbs to die while giving them cover. They're captured again and thrown into the radiation chamber, only for Cotton to realise the inspector's ship's refuelling will kill them, though they manage to escape. During the hearing, the doctor is during a hearing, the doctor is forced to go along with the marshal's lies to ensure the doctor and the others' safety only to immediately tell the truth once they bust in, having freed themselves, like after having freed themselves, only for the inspector to turn out to be a bit of a prick as well, as he ends up siding with the marshal when they, when a mutt attacks them, uh, giving the marshal full control. This ultimately backfires when the marshal imprisons his men and forces the doctor to try and sort out the atmosphere again, only for the doctor to either intentionally sabotage the operation or for it just to not work, resulting in Jaeger's death when the machine blows up in his face. Uh, meanwhile, Kai is given the crystal they found in the cave earlier and fully transforms into the space into space butterfly Jesus, uh, helping them escape and obliterate the marshal before teleporting back to Solus under his own power. Uh, in the aftermath, Sondergaard and Cotton decide to stay behind to help out the remaining mutants finish their metamorphosis, with Cotton given full control of operations of Skybase. Not wanting to stick around any longer, the Doctor makes an excuse, and him and Joe go back to the TARDIS and leave. The end. All right. Six minutes, 13 seconds. Yeah, I'm not really surprised. There was a shit ton I had to leave out just to, <laughs> just to <laughs> cut it down that much. All right, so let's talk about what we liked about the episode. And, Thomas, you are first. Um... <clears throat> Oh, God, there's quite a few things. I'm just trying to see if I can narrow down a specific aspect. Um, hmm. I guess just the villain, in a way. Like, we actually kind of get an idea, rather than him just being... I mean, to a point, he is just bloodthirsty to start with, but the idea of, like, he just doesn't want... He's, like, he's sunk his whole life into this, and now that it's about to be taken away from him, he's like, nope, fuck you, and just goes completely nuts. <laughs> I'm going to make something whether people like it or not. Hmm. All right. Uh, Matt? Um, oh 
Oh gosh. Uh, yeah. Let's sort down. What do I want to th mention off the top of my head? Um. Oh gosh. Um. Actually, uh, I really liked. Um, my nickname for them is Biggs and Wedge. The two uh officers that defect. Yeah, Stubbs and Cotton. Stubbs and Cotton. My nicknames for them were Biggs and Wedge. They they were really interesting characters, even though they didn't get much dialogue other than uh, joining the other the the other companion type characters. Yeah, I would I would actually like to add mine to that, Matt, because I like the fact that those became where there's they would be mindless functionary goons in like most other serials. The fact that they were wise enough to be sympathetic to the fact that the marshal was, you know, knucking futz. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed that because it, it was refreshing. It's refreshing mm, to yeah. see that the minions aren't completely all dumb lap dogs. Mm -hmm. They didn't get immediately shot the second that they uh, grew that they grew uh, a spine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the second they grew a pair, yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, Stubbs, I believe it was, is the one that actually started to show a lot of character development like really early on in the first episode. He's actually like at one point even legitimately sitting there with the Doctor and uh, um, Joe and they're watching what's going on in the uh, conference room. Mm. All right. So, Bill, did you have anything? Uh, yes, so I know I've said this about other stories during this era, but this is one where it particularly is poignant as well. Uh, as somebody who has done a fair amount of research into uh, imperialism and colonialism and the colonial experience, this is one of those stories where it... it shows so much of what actually happens of the exploitation of the certain mindsets and of the disregard for the populace. Uh, and the authors, the writers not trying to give an answer to something, you know, to go above their knowledge, but they're drawing from real world experiences in such a way that it's really, it's really drawing from lived experience um, to write, a story about colonialism this way to the point where if somebody were teaching a class about uh, colonialism, they could probably just introduce that class by showing this serial out of context before actually going into the real world earth examples. Well, if anybody can do an expert uh, uh, on colonialism, it would be the British. <laughs> Technically true. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, I mean, <laughs> Usually, like the British know a lot about the imperial the imperial side. Um, in theory, they don't. At least they don't. They often act like they don't understand the experience of the people who are being colonized. So mm -hmm. that's a certain level of self awareness there that um, definitely goes counter to the actions of uh, the government in many cases. Oh, I, I, I think they figured it out eventually. All right. Um, since I put mine with Matt, let's talk about what we don't like about the serial. And Thomas, you're first. Um. Hmm. I guess like. Uh. You know. It's. At least for me, it's like hard to pick out a single thing. So I'm just going to nitpick and say, wow, not so much nitpick. This is something that I was joking about from the first time I found out this character's name. And just the fact that we've only got one black guy in this entire serial and his name is Cotton. Actually, there's mm -hmm. two. Very weird to there's, me. There's two, but the other one never got a name. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Because there was there was another black guy guard that was there after Cotton had mm -hmm. switched sides. Ah. Mm. So like the only black. They must guy have one black guard at all times, I guess. 
Yeah, it is kind of awkward that he has that name, but I don't care what his name is. He's a badass in this episode. I'm not <laughs> sure, though, that they hired him to be black. I'm just, I think that's just the way the casting got went Yeah, down. he just, he just, oh, they yeah, just happened to find this guy who's willing to be a guard uh, type, and they went from there. <laughs> I mean, I'll say this much. This same guy, from what I recall, I, I think I looked at, like, other stuff he'd been in and at least one other thing had him also playing a guy named Cotton so it was like hmm. this is a trend. So, <laughs> apparently the actor's name is Rick James obviously not that Rick James <laughs> honestly I almost suggested that the I'm Rick James bit thing <laughs> as a bump <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, he does not have a wiki page, so mm. wasn't that? Yeah, big I think I had to check like an IMDb or something. Uh, yeah, I just found his IMDb. Well, if he was if he was a character named Cotton in another oh. work, it could have just been that they're like, yeah, we really liked you in this, so we're just going to give the character the same name, and we just want you to play basically the same character, <laughs> <laughs> only in space. Um. Oh. He was in uh, Blake 7. Yep. Hmm. That would have been after this. Yes. Yes, this was in 81. That would have also been the last oh. season. He's played several characters named Cotton, apparently. Mm. Unless some of them were... I mean, um, yeah. like unless some of them were like the same thing. Yeah, it says archive footage, so I'm like it's filed on an archive. Yeah archive footage for at least two of them so i'm wondering if it's like one of them is just footage. oh one of them is doctor who yeah at least one of them so okay so yeah right (coughs) especially since i spell cotton with an e for that one oh but the other one the other one has doctor who people listed as part of the cast so maybe they're both Uh, doctor who dvds ah yeah that might be it then I'm looking at his IMDB. I don't see the other cotton. They're both um, yeah, under yeah, archive yeah. footage. There's two cottons. Under but that's, that's, probably, I, that's probably what. But, oh, but I, probably okay. But I think. But I think they're both Doctor Who DVDs. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it must have been that the archive footage thing threw me off. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Basically, it's just referring back to the same character. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even though they spelt it with an E once for some reason. That's yeah. probably a typo, either in IMDb or in the... Uh, but yeah, they're both Doctor mm. Who DVDs, so they're mm. both just archive footage of that particular episode. Mm-hmm. Mm. He didn't do a lot of acting. Nope, just like mm. a At least couple not things in 72, then uh, that Blake 7 is 81, and that was about it. It's possible he might have done stuff for the stage, but it's really yeah. It's very it's very, hard, po- it's it's very possible he moved to stage, but yeah. it's hard to tell. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Matt, what did you dislike about the serial? Uh, what did I dislike about the serial? Sadly, I have to say, I'm, uh, I know they were trying with this, but man, those mutant costumes. <laughs> I don't know. I thought those They're... were some of the best Doctor Who. Uh, person in an insect yeah. costume the, the, I, I, I like look, the mutant costumes uh, uh, hold, hold on hold on I will say that they aren't completely god awful but I will say that on certain angles they look like somebody with bloated cheeks for no reason <laughs> and a really awkward nose and then in broad daylight when they go in, into the uh, big set interiors oof when they're just completely <laughs> there's no hiding what they are <laughs> It does start to this... sell in a bit more, but when they're in, when they stay in the cave and they're in, in partial shadows and stuff, it's a lot more effective. Yeah, I say this but... much: it's definitely better than anything from the Web Planet. Thank <laughs> yes, you. I, 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 that's what I, I was about to say. I I will say that this is um a recurring theme of Matt's comments, and I think it, I can definitely see it that um these obviously they don't see the costumes when writing the script. 
and it seems that they uh, they didn't light around the fact that they uh, only had a certain costuming budget, and they just lighted lit things up as if they had the uh, you know movie budget costumes in every episode. <laughs> Honestly, I'm just trying to reach for something that I really didn't like, and that's the only <laughs> thing I can think of is that the, sometimes these costumes are really not effective. <laughs> and okay. Again, it's only sometimes. <laughs> Bill, how about you? What did what did you not like about? Uh, the so mine is actually along the same theme as Matt, but not the <laughs> same thing. And that's I wasn't a fan of the angel form at the end. Yeah. Like I don't know. It like it seemed like. Partially, it's that it seemed like a statue, um, like visually. It's part it's, of it's it. It's a floating it's animated seemed, GIF. I call them ballroom blitz <laughs> because of the it, hairdo. It was so <laughs> different from anything that came before it. It didn't seem like it seemed less natural, like mm. like less like a uh, something that seemed like a reasonable uh, form of metamorphosis. Yeah. Um, and also just the yeah, le- less uh, less biological with the uh, makeup or whatever that they use. Yeah, by the way, we mentioned Snowflame earlier. Now imagine if Snowflame got his powers from radiation. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, I was almost in my summer going to make the joke of referring to that form as like Joseph and his amazing technical dream coat. <laughs> For me, it's, ball- it's Ball and Blitz. He literally looks like a uh, rock musician from like the mid-70s. Mm. For, for me I, i'm looking at that it's like oh yeah we're in color we can do blue screen now take Ooh. a look <laughs> <laughs> uh it's just like this bit just like the, even the transformation from like human to weird bug thing to space jesus was just like um Okay, this is this is like honestly, it just made me think of Digimon and how some of them will go from like tiny little monster thing to a human. <laughs> he, he needed a and, Digivice to fully. And evolve. you know what? And <laughs> and some of them always bothered me in Digimon too because they were always just like, there's no connection between these two at all whatsoever. <laughs> not the theme, not the appearance, nothing. Why are they connected? <laughs> well, the reason they're connected is hibbity jibbity. <laughs> Well, thank uh, well, you, thank you for that, because now my <laughs> brain is hearing this, and I'm I'm thinking, oh my god, um, I'm hearing the Pokemon evolution music. What kind of thing? Yes. Uh, oh, that could have been a good bump. It could have been, but I hadn't thought of it until Thomas said it. <laughs> uh. Uh. Yeah, so what I didn't like about the serial is I really didn't like the innate antigo- and um, ugh, the innate antagonistic relationship between Veron and Kai. I mean, I got it initially. They were both different sides of the political debate. Varan, mm. overseer's good. Kai, overseer's bad. Then Varan's betrayed by the by the frickin' marshal. So you would think that they would work together, albeit grudgingly. But no, Varan's just like, no, I don't fucking need your help. I'll beat them, and then I'll turn around and beat your ass, too. <laughs> and meanwhile, everyone's just like, well, good luck getting laser blasted to death. Bye. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, I, I kind of got that because it's like, the, I mean, the first thing we see of their relationship is you're a murderer. Well, it's in my nature to kill people. You're a murderer. So, like, it doesn't sound like they're ever going to be best friends just straight off from ev- ev- I, I, the relationship expect, evolving from that. I didn't expect them to be best friends. But, you know, there's the thing of my enemy's enemy. Yeah. Hmm. So I would have thought they could have at least made a grudging alliance, albeit temporarily. But no, he's like, no. Nope, I'm, going I'm to too go much of a big asshole with giant eyebrows. Like that worked <laughs> 500 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I'm no, too much of a I, giant asshole. I think that my little yeah. swords will totally work against their laser guns. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of my thought is he's lost all sense of reason. And while mm-hmm. I expected him to be bitter and vengeance-driven, I would have thought he would have, you know, 
been sensical working about with it. them for so long, he would have had some sense of, oh shit, I'm going to need allies. Nope. All right, favorite scene. Thomas. Um. Uh, hmm. God, there's a few. Uh. Oh, I'm trying to remember the. I know I, what mine I is, but I can't the, remember. I guess the bit where the uh, the marshal is basically bragging that is one, and is getting the doctor to do something, and the doctor's just looking at him like, "If you didn't have my friend's hoshes, I would knock you out right now." <laughs> He's like just all in his face as Pertwee is just done with this guy's kind of shit. He just wants to lay him out, but he knows he can't. All right, Matt. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, there was like a really quotable third doctor bit, and I'm trying to remember what it was. You mean when he's uh, talking to the inspector about you're a doctor of what? <laughs> no, there was something else uh, before that. I forget where it was and what it was now. Dang it! I wanted to have it for now, and I'm completely spaced on it <laughs> again. Um. I'm trying to look up any quotes and I'm finding zero. Thanks, Internet. Was One there thing, a thing about for. not being human? I can't remember. Like I said, I, I had it and now I can't remember even a word of it right now. Mm. Uh, okay. well, well, it, was, it wasn't the I am no man. No, no, it wasn't just a short thing. It was a speech. It was a small speech uh, he gave. Uh, Okay, was it we'll in, let you was think it? about it. Well, I didn't, I'm going to have to dig for it. I don't... There's no thinking about it. I can't remember. My brain is, was sieve. Was that the bit about genocide? No, I, I... Like he's fighting with the other scientist guy? I'm, I'm digging. No, it's... I can't remember what the whole thing was now. Like I said, I'm going to have to dig it and find myself, and I can't even guarantee I'm going to find it. Why is it my ear? Now it's not even taking me to the proper All right. episode. All right. Bill, how about you? Your okay. So I had trouble picking a specific scene, but I'll go with the scene that I reacted to the most, where I was just kind of like, yes, Doctor, that, you know, that's the right thing. To, that's the way to go about it. And that was where... Um, you know, they're coercing the doctor to fix things. So he'd basically fix things basically back to the way they were before the humans arrived. And he's like, okay, that's done. I'm not fixing anymore because that's the way it should be. And yeah, I cheer, I cheered in that moment. All right. So my favorite scene only on the lines that that is so seventies is when Joe goes into the high radiation room and it starts looking like an acid trip. <laughs> it's just one of those things that's like it only would work in the 70s. And it just hit me. That just hit me as particularly amusing. Hmm. Um... Matt's probably still looking. So I'm he'll... still looking. I'm not getting any luck trying to find this scene. I would literally have to sit here and play it back to try and find out where it is. And I can't even remember what episode it was. It's was somewhere between like episode two and four, if I'm remembering correctly. I can't even remember if it's that. It might have been five or six even. Well, unfortunately, apparently IMDb got rid of quotes, so fuck them. Uh -huh. Yeah, that really does not fucking help. I feel like, oh, I forget where, but I feel like I've found sites that have, like, literally the entire script of serials, but I forget how I found that. <laughs> that would still take me, like, a half hour to an hour of searching before I finally find mm. the spot where I'm looking for, probably. Yeah. Uh, like, I need, like, an immediate list of quotes right now and cross my fingers that they actually have it. Mm. All right. Um, so let's talk about least favorite scenes, and hopefully Matt can get back to us. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, Thomas? I 
I guess like <laughs> just because at the first it seems like just like what it came off to me the bit at the end of um the like sort of makeshift trial investigation sort of thing where that like the questioning where <clears throat> the 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 inspector or whatever is doing the questioning is just like you know do you actually have any proof that he's doing it? like it's it's ma like he's made it very explicitly clear and even the doctor like gets him to basically admit it that he's in just like a genocidal asshole and mm -hmm. the dude is still just like yeah but like you still don't have any proof so eh. and i'm just like for fuck's sake <laughs> Like while I can kind of while I can buy it, it's also still just like, oh fucking really. It wouldn't even just be like he's leaning more towards the doctor and then the mud attacks and he's like, Oh, okay, fine. Now you've given me a good scare, so now I'll believe the the bad guy. Yeah, it's just you literally watch the marshal hunt the guy down. Um, like he's a dog, and all the mutt's doing is running away. Hmm. And then the suddenly the the guy's like, oh yeah, yeah, you get everything you want. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 no. Mm. Like yeah, he's like he's like five seconds away from going into a Hitler speech, and the guy is still like, yeah, no, he's fine. Yeah. Makes you wonder what actually would cause them to, you know deliberately do that freaking bureaucracy mm -hmm. all right bill i do not think i have a least favorite scene i have not come up with one so i'll pass on that all right so my least favorite scene explosive decompression <laughs> that wasn't nope I mean, yes, they got one guy sucked out, but the way they're treating it for the rest of that, not the way decompression works. Nope. Mm. And it bothered and it... me. It's like they can't even get a freaking wind machine. <laughs> uh... Should have been the easiest thing they could have done, but mm. apparently not. Uh, and it's 70 series, so they didn't have the budget to even just be like, very quickly get something to slide down in place so they don't have to linger on it too much. Even so, you know, you'd think, could somebody go out and get a couple of, you know, fans? <laughs> you know, just down to Woolworths, get a couple of fans. We'll have it so it'll at least be blowing air. So, so people so look people's, like their hair. Yeah, so at least people look like their hair's getting blown or their, their clothing is getting tugged by the wind or something. No. Mm. Yeah, it was greatly acted, but badly affected. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what were the other bad scenes really quick that you guys picked? Uh, the um, the trial of the marshal. Okay. Where the doctor tricks him into basically um, going into a racist rant. Mm -hmm. and, and still didn't take him, yeah. And then the, the, the guys are just like, eh, whatever. Um, and then Bill couldn't think of one. Right. Okay. Um, trying to think. Bad scene. Focus brain. Trying to get off the not being able to call my good one. Um, um, really bad scene in particular for this episode. Um... I think we yeah we kind of covered it before um, the scene where uh, the the one leader of the locals is like I'm gonna go get my people and we're gonna go fight them uh, you could at least use some help but, ah, I don't need your help yeah that was my because I'm a blithering idiot and <laughs> didn't wander off where are my warriors we're going to go we're going to go attack them yeah. <laughs> We're, we're totally going to really swell, guys. <laughs> uh, was there anything else, or? 
Nah, that was about it. This is just, just really big moment of dumb that could have been avoided. Okay. And I take it you didn't find your quote. I still can't find it. I've had even wiki quotes <laughs> and stuff, and I still can't find what I'm looking for. There's just this one scene where he had a really quick uh, bit of dialogue, and I completely lost what he was even talking about. I, and constantly coming up with stuff is not going to help me. I'm just like, I don't mm. know anymore. Do you remember the, the location he was in? Like, <sighs> was it on the sky base or on the planet? I want to say he might have been on the sky base, but he spent most of his time there anyway. Hmm. You remember who else was in the scene? I can't even remember who he was talking to. Okay. Yeah, I'm like, I know there was a really good quote from him, and I'm completely got nothing now. I I was literally afraid of this, and I knew I should have kept it, and now I completely just botched. Okay. And and it just pisses me off now, and there's no way of getting it back without having to go through the entire serial again. <laughs> Okay, so let's go to final thoughts. Thomas. Uh, I really enjoyed this. I had seen at least parts of this uh, when it aired on the Australian version of the Sci-Fi Channel once. Um, I don't know why I didn't see the whole thing, or maybe I did, but it's just been so long, because this would have been before the podcast started, um, that I just remember, like, couldn't remember huge chunks there were certain bits where i'm like okay this seems vaguely familiar but i definitely don't remember the the sparkly angel thing (laughs) (laughs) um like uh, you know there are certain elements like that where it's like okay it's getting a bit too goofy but otherwise the rest of the serial around it is strong enough um that I'm willing to let it slide and just be like, okay, yep, that's the thing that's happening. Sure. (laughs) Um, I would absolutely recommend this to people. Um, It's arguable. You could say this kind of handles like the whole colonialist themes better than like colony in space, which was this season previous. Um, I think, or it might've been the, I, I think that's the other one that I gave similar praise to, if I'm not mm. mistaken. Um, but yeah. Either way, yeah. Like this, this is definitely worth checking out if you can manage to track it down, or if they ever eventually get around to <laughs> releasing this season on Blu-ray. Anything else? Um, not really, though. I'll say it was fun seeing the uh, actor who played Castellan Spandrel in The Deadly Assassin again. Of course, he played this role first. He was Jaeger. Okay. Thought I'd seen him before. All right, Matt. Well, outside my favorite scene being completely lost to me right now... <laughs> We've talked enough on uh, that. But uh, otherwise, I'd say that the plot for this story is relatively really well done. Um, uh, there's some surprisingly good characters here scattered throughout. And while I can complain about the costumes a bit, I will say that for the time, they're not the worst thing, definitely. And uh, the t- effects can be a little bit touch and go, but that's to be expected on tight budgets. And again, given the time frame. Um, I was at say majority of this is really well done and uh, the actors are definitely trying their best to do what they can for the screen and it does show. All right, Bill. Uh, so this is uh, an interesting relic from the time in which the uh, Time Lords were uh, kind of concerned with retroactively enforcing the Prime Directive. Um, which is something that pretty much goes away by the time uh, by the time we actually see Gallifrey in color. Um, so it's kind of a motivation that we don't really see outside of the Third Doctor era 
except for the time war which is a whole other and, and the daleks i mean which is a whole other that can of worms um so that's an interesting thing about this otherwise yet yeah, um a good look at um how the earth empire could actually look in terms of how imperialism goes um they tried to uh backtrack it a little bit um maybe to appease people and maybe be like, oh yeah, we're actually better than that by saying that like uh, implying that people don't know and that uh, certain people would try to stop them. But this is really how, uh, as we've mentioned, how empires such as the British empire have, you know, operated for centuries. And it's very much uh, very believable that these events would play out uh, if an earth empire were to form. Um, uh, one thing I had a thought on that I didn't really get talk about during the review is that the character of Cotton, um, just kind of stood out odd to me. He had a, um, I hadn't actually caught his name at first, but he had this, I feel a much more, um, a much more subservient way of speaking than other guards, um, coupled with his accent. And yes, the fact that he was the one black speaking uh, character on the uh, show kind of uh, almost gave the feel of uh, how like an escaped slave or a freed slave in a lot of movies or TV shows would behave, uh, which caused me a kind of which felt a little weird. I feel like a lot of that is probably coincidence, unless that's a role that the actors played before. Uh, I'm sure that nothing like that was intended, but it just felt a little weird to me. Um, and I guess that's my last thought on the episode because I pretty much said everything else there was to say. All right. So my thoughts on the episode is it is refreshing to see what would be normally just secondary goon characters be a little more aware and a little uh, more involved than your average uh, uh your average uh, set of characters. I mean, you know, this would have been like, you know, what if stormtroopers started to question uh, whether working for the emperor was a good idea? Mm -hmm. um, which, of course, we never see because the stormtroopers are all faceless goons. Yet these two managed Except that to one stormtrooper. But... <laughs> Um, but these two do this, and they do this well before even stormtroopers were invented. So, um, the doctor acts well, Joe acts well. Um, really, the only problems I have in acting is with the natives and only with Varan, and it's partly how he's written, but he also comes off as a bit woodenly acted, I think, too. I don't think the, uh, the actor agreed with the role too much. <laughs> um I swear to god I've seen the actor that plays the marshal somewhere and he is one of these people that tends to play kind of these overblown power mad bureaucrats um But, you know, there's probably a few people that play that role. Oh, I got it. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish. Um, it's <laughs> written by, um, I think this, is this the first team, team up of Bob Baker and Dave Martin? Because they're the ones that would go on to create K-9. I can't mm -hmm. say off the top of my head. No, I think they uh, they wrote uh, Claws of Axos the year before, but this was ah. their second outing in Doctor Who. Yeah. And uh, it uh, basically, I think this was uh, one of their more decent things before they hit K-9. So all in all, this is a very likable episode, and I liked it quite a bit. Now, Matt, you were saying... I thought it was a more epic. Uh, there was a little bit more epicness to this, but uh, the, uh, the speech winds around to this one really quotable 
almost like tenth doctory thing where the do- third doctor literally goes, if we screw up anything, we become shot up with antimatter, so we just become unpeople oh, doing yeah. un things uh, yeah, yeah. untogether. Yes. <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, that uh, last bit in particular is what gave yeah. me the good set of giggles. It's like, oh, there's 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 where the doctor is. There and it then, is. And then la- and then slightly later in that same speech line, he goes, and let's see let's see if it works or unworks. <laughs> yeah let's see what happens or unhappens as unhappens it okay right. yeah, I, yeah. Right. I remember yeah <laughs> yeah i remember thinking that that was a pretty good pretty good line when i heard it undoing un things un together yeah that's definitely something i could see both the second doctor and the fourth doctor saying Oh, I, I, I can see David Tennant doing it as a moment of uh, adding <laughs> yeah. a little bit of a joke to a tense moment. Matt Smith could have said it too. Oh, yeah. yeah and, and, any any of the post-2005 doctors, really. <laughs> <laughs> just do it again just as, and then just have them stop for a moment and go, that feels familiar. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, let's rate this puppy. Um and Thomas, you are first on the ratings. Oh gosh. Uh this is probably one of the easiest fives I've ever given. <laughs> uh Matt. I want to say it differently, but damn it all. Yeah. <laughs> Another five. <laughs> Bill. Yep. This is y'all one of my favorite just, doctors. <laughs> y'all just like to set the bar so high that like it's impossible <laughs> not to be the low one. Um, <laughs> well, stop being so negative, Bill. <laughs> uh, can I get past the angel form being ridiculous? <laughs> it's ridiculous, but it's seventies. Come on. Uh, to be fair, it's not on the screen for that long. Bill it's, yeah, it's has given less five three minutes. fives thus far this season. <laughs> 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 I have given one five thus far this season. I'm, I'm going to pretend that I didn't hear you because I shouldn't give in to peer pressure, and I should go with my actual vote, and it will be a Matt four. Point, it will be a four point five. Matt has given six fives this season. It's been a good season. <laughs> <laughs> Bite me. Thomas has given. Four fives this season. <laughs> and yes, I actually agree with Bill. I'm going to give this a 4.5. <sighs> I'm sorry that explosive <laughs> decompression I, thing just. I, <laughs> I actually want to go through thinking about the season, whether I'm the lower vote on average or Randy is. Oh no, I tend I tend to give higher ratings than you. I just tend to give more fours than four point five. Because I, I remember a few mm. episodes where like everybody would rate it something and you would be like, I can't do it, I can't do it, and you would go like one one lower. Hmm. Yeah, well. there there were a few of those. Well, there you go. You and Tim are the only thing to only two people to give lower than a three this entire season, as far as I can tell. Oof. Yeah, I've my lowest score this season has been a three, um, and that was Planet of the Giants, which you gave a two point five. <laughs> you also gave Romans a two point five, which I gave a three point five. Tim, though, also gave that one a two point five. <laughs> Which I think was one of Tim's lowest ratings. Uh, For the Romans? Than... I'm trying to remember what pissed him off about that one. I forget. Yeah, I'd have to rewatch the podcast. Anyway, yeah. between us, that comes out with the 4.8 that the Ambassadors of Death used to be. <laughs> so it will be taking the Ambassadors of Death place at number 24. Out of a grand total of 355 things reviewed. It is on par with, and I just said all of these last week, (laughs) 
Pyramids of Mars, Dalek, Genesis of the Daleks, Empty Child, Dr. Dances, Time Heist, The Macro Terror, Tooth and Claw, The Robots of Death, Dark Water. And it is not as good as the Unearthly Child minus the Type of Gum and the Pirate Planet. There's not a lot near the top. <laughs> so there we go. Number 24 out of 355. That is all we have to say about the mutants. All right. So uh, let us know in the comments below what you think about the mutants. Um, and don't forget to like or dislike uh, this video if you feel those things. And, of course, make sure you subscribe on YouTube or follow on Twitch or both uh, to make sure you keep getting our new podcasts every week. All right. Next week, we will conclude our Third Doctor's Unreviewed Serials with the last one that we have yet to review. We go ahead a season or two to The Carnival of Monsters, written by Robert Holmes. And starring John Pertwee as the Doctor and Katie Manning as Joe Grant. We will see you next week. See you all next time.